Um, so, hello and welcome. As, as it's been said, my name is Honza Kral, and apparently I should be more careful about what I say uh, before, before the talk. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to sort of answer, answer this, this question, which is not really a question, and that is, what, did, what does it take to, to be an engineer? What, what does it do? What, does it, what is it, this, this engineering thing? And maybe, hopefully, we can try and gain some insight together that maybe we've been focusing on the wrong thing all over. So this is a story, right? And every story begins with once upon a time. In my case, the once upon a time, that was uh, my early high school when I was deciding you know, what to do when I grow up. At that time, I was still thinking that I was ever going to grow up. Uh, so I decided that I want to sort of play around with computers, because that's what I've been doing uh, uh, for, for a long time then. I was, I was fortunate enough that both of my parents were engineers, and there was always a computer in the house that I could, that I could keep fiddling with and, and try to get it running and see how much punishment it can take be before it blows up. Like, what happens if you delete this one file? And hey, what is this? What is this? Uh, auto start bat or whatever and, and what happens if I if I change this content and so I, I did I did a bunch of stuff like that but obviously like I was I was an early teenager my focus was elsewhere I, and that was obviously video games and uh, it wasn't like I wasn't one of those people who wanted to create their own video game etc no I was I was never that ambitious I just wanted to get it running and uh, there was a lot of things that, that prevented me from doing that or that made it harder. Usually in the end I, I succeeded and I got it running, but there was a bunch of stuff that I had to do always, uh, especially in the later days of my early childhood, if that's not confusing enough, where you know, to get the sound running I knew that I had to input these three numbers to configure my sound card. It was IRQ, DMA and some other something like that. To this very day, I have no idea what those numbers meant. I know that I had to input 220 and 1. And that I had no idea. And, and to this day, I still don't. And, but it, it worked. And every time it worked, I felt amazing. I felt this, yeah, I did that. I, j I just configured the game. You know, it, it kind of a low goal, but you know, I was happy. I, I got my game and, and the sounds were there. And it didn't really matter too much that I didn't know what all of these shortcuts meant because, hey, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn all about it. So I applied to school. You know, uh, I wanted to be a software engineer, so obviously I needed to study computer science. Because what else is software engineering than applied computer science, right? Well, we'll see about that. Um, so, and so I started studying. And it was amazing and overwhelming and crazy. I, I studied math that I didn't even know existed before. And, and it was algebra and calculus and analysis and complex analysis and, and combinatorics and graphs and all of, these, all of these things. Some of them were cool and some of them I could see how, they could, uh, how I could use them. Some of them I, I was very proud that I would, was able to pass them because that meant that I can learn pretty much any gibberish overnight and then pass an exam. Like, I still to this day have no idea what, what is the difference between the different integrals, but I, I can probably name them. And that's about it. Please don't ask me those questions. There will be no beer if, if this question is asked. Uh, so that was, that was the school. That was the beginning. And, and I was very happy because I was learning the theory, the underlying, you know, the underpinnings of the entire field. Uh, because. I, don't, I didn't want to bother with the mundane details like you know, the actual engineering part, uh, like the actual programming languages and how to write code or how to maintain code, et, et cetera. I had some more, as I, as I would call them back then, probably pedestrian uh, ta uh, classes, uh, like, I don't know, Java or database systems or functional programming or something like that. But I, those weren't as important. And again, they, they fell into the same category of, I have no idea what I'm doing, but somehow, eventually, I can make it work. I was copy-pasting stuff, randomly changing things until, until it worked. Yeah, I, I should have realized back then that that's going to be my whole life. But, uh, 
So what happened, what happened then? Even while I was in school, a school which, by the way, I never finished, just so that I don't give you a, a false idea of who I am, um, I, started, I started a job. And it was, it was a nothing job. It was just a, it was just a temp job by, by, uh, while I was still enrolled in school. And it was about you know, helping this big company maintain their data warehouse environment. Sounds fancy, but literally it was cut work. All I had to do was like, hey, there is a server there with the hundreds of files. We don't know what's in them. Can you please catalog them? Yay. So there was a lot of manual labor. There was a lot of, lot of shell scripting, et cetera. That's not interesting. What was interesting about the job was how I got it. Um, it, was, it was this big company, and they held interviews. And I applied, and I had an interview. And this, this, this guy asked me all of these, all of these questions, you know, these, these theoretical, abstract questions, like, how would you solve you know, this, this famous problem? And I had obviously no idea, but I heard it in school associated with this algorithm or this data structure. So that's what I would reply with. And they were ecstatic. They were super happy, and I got the job. It, it took me exactly two days to figure out why, because I, I was only starting after two days. And that was the hiring manager, the, the person responsible for making the decision, went to the same school that I did. So, so they had the very same background that I did. They, they were just looking for a person like themselves. And, and to me, that made perfect sense, right? He can do the job, and, and this is his background. So if he finds somebody else with the same background, they'll be able to do the job just as well, right? I mean, it does make a little bit of sense. And at that time, I didn't question it. It was like, yeah, that, that, makes, perfect, that makes perfect sense. Um, so I, I stayed at the job. I was, I was very successful. And by the standards of this job, that means I didn't burn anything down. Uh, so I didn't burn anything down. And I found a, a, a real job this time. Um, and the real job was using Python, doing, doing, some, doing some programming. And I sort of maintain this, this attitude that that's really what's important, you know, the algorithms and the data structures, the computer science basics. And I try to inject them into every conversation and into every, every meeting, et cetera. I don't think I was necessarily trying to be an asshole, but it just kind of, you know, happened. And so I would be the, the, the guy sitting in a meeting say, uh, asking you know, the smart questions. You know, that's, that's all nice, but you know, how will this actually scale? Or you know, uh, what, is the, what is the complexity of your solution? Are you sure there are not any more optimal algorithms out there? And, and clearly, again, there was somebody, somebody there who, who had the same ideas, um, or maybe, maybe they were misconceptions. Uh, that this is what's really important. So I got promoted. I became a senior engineer. <laughs> ha. And, and that was scary. Like, I had, I had at least that much you know, self-introspection to, to know that, yeah, that, that that's not right. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't say it out loud. And maybe I'm only saying it looking, looking back, because back then I was, I was pretty happy. Um, but it made me think, like, what is this job that I'm, I'm supposed to do? What should I do with this team that I'm now suddenly semi-leading? Semi Which means I was the one buying beer. Uh, so what, what, is, what is this? And uh, I, st I started with you know, trying to impart my, my values and, and trying to make everybody as successful as I was. You know? or better or worse, usually worse. Uh, so I was obsessed with these, with these kinds of questions. Uh, like, hey, what is the difference between a list and a tuple? Like, are you, are you sure you're using the right one for the correct situation? And I, I painted myself in a corner a little bit, because these, these problems pop up so often that eventually, like after a few days, I was doing nothing else than just asking, hey, list or tuple, list or tuple. Uh, there was more variety in those questions, but that was, that was pretty much uh, the gist of it. And so I had to step back a little bit and ask myself, like, is that something that really matters? And 
obviously this was this was in Python. So I so I started started thinking about it. Does this really matter? Well, the questions were what uh, the answer was obvious. Of course not. Like we are not you know doing rocket science. After all, we were working in Python. We were building a website. The difference between a list and a tuple is is negligible to say the least. Uh, and and even at our at our level, you know, senior, uh, we were able to see that, because there were many other changes that when we made, uh, the the impact was orders of magnitude bigger than you know list versus tuple, which we never even bothered to measure, because we just, well, I just knew that one is better than the other. So, so that was sort of the, the, first, uh, the first lesson that I, that I brought home from, from using Python. And that is, you know, the, the language, it, it doesn't really matter as I thought it did. It's not about the deep technical implementations. It's not about the speed of the language. It's not about the, the algorithm underneath. Sure, I'm, I'm glad that there are, there are, there are smart people that, that are figuring all of that out so that I don't have to. And I'm sure that at some level, it, it, actually, it actually matters. But on the level that we were using it, bu building websites in Django, nah. That was not the important part. So what else, what else was important for us? Well, obviously, it was working with the ecosystem. Uh, because when we, when we went around and sort of started doing these exercises, what is, what is holding us, us back the most? What are we spending most of our time on? And sure, there was coding somewhere up there, but uh, one of the top things was, hey, how do we choose a library? How do we actually determine which framework to use, which tool to use, or something like that? And we each had our own way of, of doing that, and I'm sure everybody here does. And that is, that is usually pretty simple. Hey, if we've, if we've already solved this problem in some other application inside the team, let's do the same thing here. If some other team in the organization has, has solved it using a, a tool A, let's use tool A as well. And so on and so forth. Ultimately, you get to the questions of how good is the documentation. Uh, if I try it and play with it for 5, 15 minutes, uh, can I get something done? And Again, when you, when you look at all of these answers, which, which I hope makes sense to a lot of people here, you notice that it's not that much about the code. Sure, it's there, and it's always there as the underpinning requirement that you have, because it needs to do the job, it needs to work. But ultimately, it's not necessarily the, the quality or the design of the code, let alone some data structures and algorithms, uh, that dictate a success of a project or the, the usefulness of a project. And I'm sure you all know plenty of examples, for better or worse, where a project succeeded not because of the quality of the code, but because of other things. I mean, take a look at Django. Uh, Django is, is a great piece of software. The code is great. But ultimately, at the very beginning, a lot of its success was because of the documentation. It was because of the community. It was because of how helpful everybody, everybody was. So again, the second, the second sort of uh, thing we focused on, and again, it was not that technical. And finally, there is this, there is this thing about the community. So the original quote is, of course, come for the language, stay for the community. I, I interjected the middle bit a little bit because you know, I have to make it mine. Not implemented here is a thing even for quotes. So uh, the community was when we started interacting with the Python community at large, first through Django and then, uh, then other sort of related tools. And up until that point, we still were kind of locked in, in, in the thinking, or at least I was. I'm sorry, my last name is Kral, so I tend, to tend towards the royal we. Um, <laughs> It, I was I was always thinking that yeah this is you know this is how an engineer is supposed to supposed to look maybe a little bit more in shape ideally but ultimately like this is this is what we are right we we studied it we were playing with computers since we were since we were early age and and that's it because ultimately all it's about it's the code you know we're we're rational 
uh, logical people just driven by facts and data. So, so the code is the most important part. And suddenly I saw in the community like all shapes and sizes of contributions and contributors. And different people had different areas of interest and expertise. Uh, to, to my shock and dismay, I found that the largest portions of Jenga were, were designed by our journalist. Imagine the shock. <laughs> so again, like probably it's not necessarily just about the code. Sure, the code is, is important, but it's just a necessary requirement. It's by no means a sufficient one. And, and again, we went back and, and sort of, I wish we, were, we went back, but we should have gone back and, and sort of re-evaluated uh, how, we, how we do things as we did before. When we discovered that the, one of the biggest problems is choosing libraries, like we switched our interview process. Instead of just asking for, hey, what is this? Uh, uh, how do you solve this problem? Or here, there is a whiteboard. Uh, write some code or something like that. And, and we absolutely did that to, to, my, to my greater shame. Uh, we instead started asking, like, hey, how do you, how do you choose a library? How do, you, how do you go about resolving problems where person A wants to use library A and vice versa? What is, what is the process that you have? And, and suddenly, we saw completely different, different things. Because a lot of people were not used to thinking about those things. And maybe because it was uh, uh, based on the uh, people that we targeted. But this was kind of you know, stupefying for a lot of people. Like, why, why, do, you, why do you ask that? I, I don't want to be a maintainer. I, I want to be, be a coder. But isn't that kind of part of the job? So we went. In, our, in my mind, in my ideal, idealized situation of the past, we went deeper and started to ask the big questions. Not necessarily the Vim versus Emacs one, though that was, that, was, that was a big one too. Fortunately for us, it was very simple because everybody in the office either used, uh, either used Vim or there were some people who used Nano and we all agreed that those are weird and, and we uh, should not be engaged. Uh, but, you know, Whatever we started talking about, you know, young people just newly promoted, we had all the answers, right? If we couldn't figure it out, no one could. Like, if only the people in the Middle East asked us, like, we would have none of these issues right now. Um, and so ultimately, it always came down to, to this question. Talent or skill? What is actually required for you to be an engineer? What is the more important one? And we went back and forth. And ultimately, you know, as engineers, even senior ones, uh, we came back with, it depends. You know, it depends on very many things. And what kind of job are you talking about? And, and you know, are you just building web apps? Or are you the, the one, um, uh, one of the chosen few actually working on the tools underneath? And, Et, et, et cetera, et cetera. And there were different sort of scales to it. And, and we could talk for hours and not really say anything and just you know, affirm each other's preconceptions. Uh, because that's really what it was, uh, what it was about. You know, why are we asking these questions? Uh, we were asking the, the question to, to affirm ourselves because I wanted to hear that I was special. The person next to me wanted to hear that they were special because you know we we mastered this thing, this, this this sorry this thing, this esoteric uh, tool of the trade that that rest of the world out there doesn't really understand and and they view us in awe of our powers and what we can do, and and we did the same thing, like hey look I can run some code and and there's a web page rendered yay, so. So that's mostly why we were asking the questions. And ultimately, we figured out, or again, I hope we did, that that is the most important question. Why do you ask? Are you, are you trying to be you know, a, a questionable person like, like I was back then, trying to affirm their own superiority or uniqueness? 
or, or some other attribute that they wish they had? Or do you really want to know? But you need to take it a step further. Like, what, what will the answer actually do? Because as much as we like to pretend that we are, we are cool, logical people driven by data and logic and nothing else, uh, that's not true. Because the key word in that sentence is people. And as much as we like to deny it, like we are still all people. And people are driven by emotions. And they, we all have our own inherent biases and upbringings and all of these things that we, that we bring with us. And in that context, what happens when you, when you tell someone that the thing they're trying to do requires talent and they're not successful? Well, if you're any, uh, anything like me, uh, you kind of give up. Because like, why would I try? I, I believe that it requires talent and I couldn't do it, therefore I don't have the talent and there is nothing I can do to acquire talent. I might as well, you know, pick up my bags and go. And, that is, and this is especially strong for people who, who believe that they don't have the talent. A lot of the times because we were told by, by many different people in, in subtle and not so subtle ways that people who look like you typically don't have the talent. That's okay, you can do other things. So, so that's what happens. You tend to, you tend to give up and, and, and take a step back. At least I would. So what then happens when, when you tell them it's a skill? Well, that's easy. Because a skill gets perfected with repetition. So in the beginning, I told you that I was learning by copy pasting stuff and changing things until it worked. And I would do that every single, every single time. You know, there's the famous off by one problem. Every time you run some calculation, the answer is wrong by plus one or minus one. That's, that's a generic rule with no exceptions. Well, maybe one or minus one. <laughs> so, uh, and I encountered this very often when I, was, when I was starting, especially because of the types of tasks that we were doing in school, which were mostly about computation and, and things like that. So I, I tried something, it came off, uh, off by minus one. So I did plus one to it. Suddenly everything worked. Uh, the next time, uh, I, well, I did the same thing. But the 10 times after that, I tried to put in the plus one right away. I didn't quite really know why yet, but I just, it, was, it was more of an intuition. So first thing that I gained was some intuition. Hey, this looks similar. I've, I've, I've done this before. And a plus one in this place really, really solved it. Cool, let's try that. And, and then 100 times after that, you finally understand. Maybe. There are definitely some areas where I still to this day have no idea. And I just do plus one, minus one. I don't care. Uh, but after the hundredth repetition, you typically understand. You, you sort of internalize the, the intuition and really know not only that you have to put a plus one right here, but also why. What does it mean for, for there to be a plus one in this size, uh, in this place? Maybe I'm compensating for the different counting. Uh, some people count with, uh, uh, with uh, zero-based uh, counts. Some are wrong. You know, so there is always, there is always this, uh, this situation. So maybe, maybe, you start to, maybe you start to understand. So that's the, that's the important, uh, important thing. We are not, we are not cool, uh, logical thinking machines. Actually, we are, just, we are just people. And that is the most more important part of being an engineer. So, uh, to this day, as I said, I don't understand what those, what those settings for my sound card were. What do they mean? I, I'm pretty sure it has something to do with like, some addressing and some memory access or something like that. Like That much I learned. That was the kind of intuition. And, and because when I looked up DMA, it says something about direct memory access. Uh, but that was about it. And I'm absolutely OK with it. 
All my education and all my experience brought me to the state where I am actually okay with not having the answer. Like, that's fine. I can still, I can still use it. There are other things where I don't even have that. I don't understand it and I cannot, cannot do it. I mean, have you ever tried working with CSS? <laughs> like, I tried to change the, the color of the font before, before the talk because I figured out that it cannot be read from the back. It took me 15 minutes. I'm, I'm well, semi ashamed to admit it, but it's, it, it's just that. And I don't care. Like, it's just not something that I'm, that I'm interested in. I don't think lesser of me because of that. And not just necessarily because of my overinflated ego, though that definitely plays a role too. But it's just, it's okay. I can still be, I can still be valuable uh, to, to myself and to my team and to my, to my company. Because it's not about these things. A lot of it is about other things. So, as you know, every other talk, well, no, it, as, as most of my talks go, uh, this could be also summarized in a tweet. And usually, when, when it takes a tweet to summarize something, it will not be my, by me. So uh, this is a tweet by Russ. And it's very, it's very important uh, because that essentially sums up everything that I talked about, if you, if you think it through. Which is, we often talk about the hard skills and the soft skills that it takes to be a human or an engineer. And, and typically, we emphasize for an engineer the hard skills. Right, the code, the algorithms, the data structures, yay. And the soft skills, meh, like they're nice to have, right? Well, actually, if you redefine them a little bit to the technical, which are super important, like you have to have them, but then the professional skills, like the, the skills that it takes to be successful, to, to be a, a a valuable member of a, of a team, whether it's team at work, whether it's in the community, whether it's something else. That would be the professional skill. And after all, when, when doing these things, uh, when I ask you the question, what, it, what does it take to be a software engineer? Well, primarily, software engineer is a profession. It's not a, it's not a hobby. You can, you can code as a hobby, that's fine, but a software engineer, that's a profession. And that's why you need these, these professional skills. And that's why I personally believe that they are the more important of the two. Because there are plenty of people who have the technical skills. But without the professional skills, they will not be successful. They will, they will not be successful, not necessarily as in, as in career or anything like that but as in actually being what we would consider like a, like a senior, senior engineer, somebody who can, who can mentor, mentor others, who can lead a team, who can make sound technical decisions. As I, as I walked you through it uh, in the past half an hour, uh, you saw that a lot, of these, a lot of these decisions are more based around the professional skills and less so on the technical skills. So that's it. That's my take on what it takes to be an, in, to be an engineer. So I'm hoping that, that you saw something, uh, something in the talk uh, for you. Hopefully you did, didn't identify with young me because that was not a good experience. Uh, but thank you so much. And as has been said, if you have absolutely any questions, come find me. I'm the guy who looks like this. And I'll be happy to answer any and all of your questions.